so good afternoon everyone uh, welcome to our month on non-fossil fuel process heating or heat pump month as has been referred to in other forms um, and and uh, we're going to be largely focused on this month on uh, uh, heat pumps and, uh, and fossil free uh, process heating uh, my name is Jared Leake and I'm the CEO of the Australian Alliance for Energy Productivity. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, my start this webinar by acknowledging the traditional custodians of where I am living and broadcasting from in the northern suburbs of Sydney, uh, that being the Daramurrugal people, and I pay my respects to their elders and uh, past present. Uh, if you'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which you reside, uh, feel free to, to do so in the chat. And for those of you that are new to A2EP, uh, we're a non-for-profit organisation. We're funded by members who share our mission to double Australia's energy productivity. In short, A2EP is here to help business pursue a cleaner and more successful future by producing more with less. We explore the world for best practice, uh, we connect stakeholders and members, and we advocate for programs and policy to help increase energy productivity and jobs towards a zero emissions future. So in this webinar today, we've got an hour and a half and uh, looking forward to, to nice and interactive and I'm sure you'll have questions of our speakers. Uh, so feel free to type those questions in the Q&A box and then upvote other questions if you like them. Or if you wanna have a, a side chat or a side discussion in the, in the chat box, go for it there as well. Um, our speakers will be ready to answer your questions hopefully at the end of their presentations if we, time, if, if we have time. If not, straight after the presentation. Uh, um, while someone else is talking, they can do some answering of questions in the background. Uh, so we'll have we'll, a uh, very good chance to be able to get to your question. Uh, these uh, presentations uh, uh, will be distributed next week along with a recording. Uh, so no need to take too much in the way of notes. You're going to get all the presentations there next week. Uh, I thought I'd start off with today uh, a little bit of a summary of uh, just some thoughts on the low emissions technology statement. You may see this came out uh, just uh, yesterday uh, uh, from the, uh, the federal government here. And uh, there's some, some nice little changes in there that are going to affect our industry, that's for sure. Um, here's a couple of the sort of main themes that are coming out of that. And, and you'll see some new activities and new comments there from the likes of Arena about solar 30, 30, 30. Uh, was that 30% efficiency, 30 cents per, per watt and, and by 2030. Um, a new one on the voluntary zero emissions gas market, a little bit more of that in the moment. Um, and, and more on hydrogen and what have you. Uh, but yeah, look, we, we clearly see uh, more and more money and, and attention coming this way into, the, into our sector. And of course, we're supportive of that. Uh, I mentioned before about this uh, voluntary emissions zero uh, uh, gas market, and, and that's certainly going to be supported by a new method for biomethane. So great that we're going to be talking about that today and, and what can be done there. Um, there's also yep, more money for hydrogen, $460 million there for, for the hydrogen hubs. We're also going to touch on hydrogen today. Um, another area where we'd like to think we've made a big impact ourselves, as you'll see in, in the section on other emerging technologies, is heat pumps. Uh, and they're specifically broken out as a, as a technology to watch. And, and we're pretty confident that we're going to see a lot more attention on that. And that's why we're doing a, more webinars on that one later this month. So... Uh, Speaking with us today, uh, joining us today, we have uh, Craig Dugan from Optimal, uh, Thomas Strang from Just Stand Pacific. Um, uh, Craig's going to be taking us through biogas and hydrogen, and then uh, Thomas is going to be taking us through uh, biomass, sorry, Craig on biogas, that is. And then followed by that, we have uh, Dr. Scott Grierson talking to us about uh, gasification and technologies to, to convert to uh, biomass. And finally, we're going to have a discussion on solar thermal from Kurt Drews. But to open the uh, discussion up and, and the, the webinar today, I thought we'd throw a little bit of context in what, into, what, into what we're talking about today. And I've got to have uh, my dear friend Alan Pierce joining me uh, in just a moment to talk about um, what's happening with uh, the other alternatives. Um, we, we said later in the month, we're going to talk about heat pumps. Uh, today, we're going to talk biogas, hydrogen and what have you. But there's actually quite a bit more when it comes to electrification. So I'm going to get Alan to, to, step, us, to step us through that. Uh, 
Um, before I do, let me just, uh, just take us through a little bit of what we're talking about here. We are talking about process heating for industry. And uh, this one taken from that uh, lovely ARENA ITP report, breaking down that uh, process heating requirements. And you'll see that's 44% uh, of uh, energy consumption in Australia uh, going to industry of that 52% going for, for heat and the majority of that being supplied by natural gas and coal. Um, a large chunk of that is being supplied at, uh, at very high temperatures above 800 degrees, um, but there's certainly a lot of it below uh, that sort of 250 degree mark that we think a lot of the technologies that we'll look at to do today will certainly be uh, displacing. Um, with that, in that same report, there was also a, 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 a nice table here showing the costs of the different major technologies available to process heating. Now, this report came out in 2019. Uh, we've, we've been uh, checking that through different pre-feasibility studies and, and, and we've seen that, that this, these cost estimates here are largely what's being seen in practice. Um, if, if you um, look, for instance, the, if I take the, uh, the magenta one here, um, this is an 80 degree heat pump lift um at 10 cents per kilowatt hour you know the major change that we've seen for that is really that, that electricity is available closer to six cents a kilowatt hour under a ppa or, or on-site solar pv so there's that's why i put those arrows that downward pressure there but but all of these other ba shaded bands are, are seem to be quite accurate of, i have heard and and, and uh, things like for, for solar thermal uh that is maybe a little bit high in some cases but you know it does give a, a fairly decent indication um, the only thing, the other thing to note of this, since uh, this was, paper was done in 2019, is that the focus now on hydrogen. So hydrogen really, really has taken off and it wasn't really considered uh, in this uh, study in 2019, but uh, uh, it'd be good to have that one added in there. Right at the moment, though, at, uh, at uh, three or four dollars per kilogram, it's certainly sitting on the higher end here. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, Alan Piers to join me to talk about uh, different technologies as well. Um, for those of you that don't know Alan, Alan is an industry fellow at RMIT. Um, he is, the, I'll say, the thought leader for A2EP. Uh, Alan finds himself getting involved in just about every major publication when it comes to energy efficiency in the country, working with Beyond Zero Emissions and with governments and what have you. So it's a pleasure to welcome here and join me here today. Alan, would you like to take us through a few of these other technologies that are available before we get into some of the other major ones? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jared. And uh, it's great to be here, especially with all these experts who, who I'll learn a lot from on the more specific technologies. But yeah, I've, got, I've just got a quick cameo here to, um, to just highlight to people that um, there are a lot of emerging uh, or indeed long long lived uh, alternatives to think about when we're looking at uh, process uh, heat and uh, this slide here just shows you on the right hand side um, that, that there are a lot of non-thermal processes like uh, using pressure or vacuums or microfiltration or centrifuges or lots of things like that that can actually replace heat quite well. On the other hand, there's also a lot of thermal processes and many of them are using electricity in various ways. Uh, and again, moving on the, from the point that, that Jared made, um, now that uh, power purchase agreements with renewable electricity are looking pretty attractive, the, the numbers uh, for a lot of these alternatives are starting to look a lot better than they used to as well. Um, next, thanks, Jared. Um, of course, if you step right back, you, you should ask the first question, um, do I need the process that I'm trying to provide heat for? Um, and again, with lots of developments such as prefabrication or pretreatment of materials or things like that, uh, it is possible now to um, avoid a process, um, or at least minimise it. Um, then, as I said already, there's these non-thermal and thermal processes. Another important thing about quite a few of these options is that you can target them very precisely. And that's a big way of saving, but it's also a way of achieving flexibility and responsiveness. Uh, so again, you can use the energy when and where it's needed. Um, 
likewise, and I'll touch on this a bit later too, we're getting much better at identifying the potential to recover and, and often uh, upgrade the temperature of waste heat uh, and capture both the sensible heat and the latent heat. And what we're finding, in a, particularly in a lot of food exhaust streams, there's a lot of latent heat that is very useful if you can get it um, and then use a heat pump to crank up its temperature. Uh, next, thanks. The other thing that's important, as we're moving towards more variable activity and more point of use technology, uh, the importance of measuring and monitoring and carrying out analytics, including analytics that are based on your real-time production as well as your energy use, um, is become very, becoming very important because you want to be able to accurately target things. But also what we find is that, for example, a lot of people don't actually realise how inefficient their central steam systems are and things like that. And once you start looking at that, the business case for some of these alternatives can be improved a lot uh, over what people used to think. Um, also, what we're seeing now is emerging uh, business models, particularly, say, in rural and regional areas who don't have access to gas grids. Um, they can use modular production technologies as well as modular distributed energy solutions uh, and can create totally different business models uh, that uh, often are focused on enhanced value for the farmer rather than be, being a price taker for a supply chain. And of course, we're seeing tourism and all sorts of things like that happening. Next slide. This is just a quick one. I, I thought it was, as I was doing the research for this, I came across Miele's new radio frequency oven for households. And you can see from the, the piece of uh, fish there that you can, you can cook very precisely now with uh, some of the technologies around. And I was sort of proud that they could keep, they could leave the sauce cold while they cooked the, uh, the food. Um, microwaves also, I think, are, are coming into their own in many ways. And in particular, when you're trying to uh, get the water vapor out of um, something like grains or even the cells of timber, um, microwaves are a great way of doing that much faster than just blasting with uh, heat. Um, so again, there's all this opportunity now to do things so differently from what, what we've been doing for a long time. Next, thanks. Oh, that's it. I'm finished for now. <laughs> You're finished for now. You're coming back later, Alan. We're going to finish off today talking about end user services and heat recovery. Uh, but thanks, Alan, much appreciated. It, 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 it's, uh, there is such a, a wide range of different technologies, and of course, it's going to be horses for courses. And uh, as this transition uh, happens for, for decarbonisation, it's, it's, it's not a given exactly which one is going to be right for, for uh, which application, but we're, we'll be finding that out. Alan, many thanks. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Craig Dugan. Uh, Craig's going to be taking us through hydrogen and biogas and Craig I'll get you to, uh, to share your screen. Um, Craig is, is, uh, is an accomplished executive uh, looking after companies. He grew the uh, process group um, into a, to a global engineering force. Uh, over, over many years working there and since then's moved on to be the managing director for Optimal and, and uh, with their focus on green fuels and green, uh, um, uh, green um, uh, initiatives. Uh, it's great to have such an experienced uh, managing director driving this uh, innovation. Um, Craig, hand over to you and, and look forward to hearing about what's going on with uh, green energy alternatives. Thank you, Jared, for that very kind uh, introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Now, I, I, I like to use a lot of slides so that you don't fall asleep. So uh, you need to concentrate on what, what's coming up, um, but this will obviously be available uh, later on. So, um, so what are we, what the challenge? And the, Jared put some slides up before about uh, the, the problem that we have uh, in terms of industrial energy, it's not all currently uh, uh, required as just electricity from sockets and cables. There's a huge number of industries that require high temperature heat and currently the, you know, the best solution for that is 
probably with natural gas uh, compared to coal because you can have low emissions. But increasingly there is a focus on the emissions from burning natural gas and also the emissions from producing natural gas. And you know, we see many of our food type customers that uh, over 70% over of their energy requirements are thermal. So uh, we need, in order to get, you know, if you get companies chasing net zero by 2030, uh, the challenge is how do they get there uh, quickly uh, with what you know with existing technology and we think that green gas uh, is the solution now that green gas doesn't you know, we're, we're agnostic on the molecules it can be hydrogen it can be biomethane uh, it could it can be a mix of those uh, as long as it can go into existing combustion equipment uh, so Food waste, everyone knows this, food waste is a massive problem for the world, not only because it, people should be eating it, but when we dispose of it in landfill, uh, it has, it produces greenhouse gases and these greenhouse gases just add to the problems that we already have. Australia, unfortunately, is a laggard in this area. Um, currently, uh, uh, over 40% of our waste is still going into landfill. Compare that to Western Europe, they're down to rates below sort of four than three percent. So we've got a lot of material still going to landfill, which should be being converted into energy. Uh, Europe has, uh, as I said, has learnt this lesson, uh, and uh, that slide there just shows the amount of biogas that's already being produced in Europe. And initially, most of that biogas was being produced sort of on farm or at at, at source and being turned into electricity, but increasingly as renewables have saturated the grid with low cost renewable electricity, more and more of that gas is finding its way into the natural gas infrastructure. Um, so how does that sort of translate in the Australian context? So this is the Victorian uh, wholesale cost of gas uh, since 2014, and no surprises, you can see that the cost trend is upwards. And I want to show that because well, the first thing when you talk about renewable gas, everyone says, oh, well, it's, it's too expensive. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, is that you can produce biogas now uh, and get it into the grid for, we believe, around about eight to $10 a gigajoule, which is directly comparable against current natural gas prices. So we think the market is right. So how are you going to use this? So this is just um, what to do. So, um, yeah, and, and most people sitting on this presentation today would be aware of these sorts of things. But what we're saying is use natural gas, could then through your electricity retailer, get uh, a green gas contract, and then use that natural gas to produce energy behind the meter. And you can do that in co generation, tri generation, or quad generation. So, uh, in, with our turbines, Typically, our 65 kilowatt turbine produces 65 kilowatts of electricity and 155 kilowatts of recoverable heat. If we do that as hot water, it would be about 120 kilowatts to 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, our one megawatt package does about uh, 1.9 megs of heat. And again, depending on whether you do it direct by hot water or steam, then the amount that you get uh, can be reduced. Um, uh, you can, uh, as I said, you can do steam. So Alpha Laval have a uh, have a proprietary um, standard uh, steam generator, which will fit onto our turbines or onto gas engines, and and you can also go to manufacturers, HRSG manufacturers, where you can co-fire these uh, these steam generators. So you can put additional thermal energy in if you need more steam than is than is available from the heat of the turbine or the exhaust. And here's just some examples uh, of this. This one on the top left is one we're doing at the moment for uh, Costa uh, Foods in Gyra in New South Wales, a huge hothouse, I think it's about 30 hectares. And we're doing what we call quad gen there. So we've got a turbine which is producing electricity. The turbine is currently fueled on LNG. The, we do hot water heat recovery at 85 degrees. That goes into huge hot water storage tanks and used at night time. Uh, the cooled exhaust is then used to directly fire their existing uh, eight megawatt boiler. And by using hot, that, that warm air, we recover that, that warm air that's in that exhaust. 
uh, and that exhaust is then finally cooled and goes directly into the hothouse for CO2 fertigation because they want 800 ppm CO2 on the hothouse. That's, in fact, you can see there, there that's the boiler and here's the hot air mixing. Uh, we're doing a project for McCain's where we're taking bio, biofuel from an anaerobic digester, uh, making power and again using the hot air firing of their, for their existing boiler and that takes about a 15% thermal load or natural gas load off their existing boiler. So all these things are, uh, I mean, this is all existing kit, existing technologies, just further enabled by the availability of biofuels. So we think biogas has got massive potential. We think any, any customers or any companies that have the potential to generate biogas behind the meter are sitting on a resource as valuable or potentially more valuable than, than behind the meter solar. Um, but those customers who don't have that, hopefully in the not too near future, they'll be able to get green gas from the grid. Just an example of what this looks like behind the grid, sorry, behind the meter. So McCain's in Ballarat, 600 tonnes a day of potatoes to make 400 tonnes a day of French fries, 200 tonnes a day of waste. That waste uh, we are using to, uh, you can see here, we're using that to generate 1.2 megs of electricity. And the thermal heat from that, from the, our turbine exhaust is going directly into their boiler. Now, what's interesting at this site is that they put in, uh, they put in a, P, uh, a PPA um, solar installation behind the meter, seven megawatts. And you can see here, that's their reduction in CO2 emissions. So about 11,000 tonnes per annum. Our turbine, which is only generating 1.2 megawatts of electricity, has provided a larger CO2 emissions reduction for them because we're displacing a lot of natural gas. So, uh, so you can see, you know, together these two technologies uh, provide a really good overall reduction in in CO2 footprint, but also a reduction in energy cost to the customer. And that's just another summary slide of some of the uh, the, the things. Now, what we can also do there is if that customer had additional hydrogen, there, or sorry, additional solar, or they wanted to put more solar in, we could, we could use that solar to produce some behind the meter hydrogen, and that hydrogen could then be used in the boilers, in the turbines, or both. Uh, and because they have waste water that obviously comes out of their anaerobic digester, uh, then the oxygen from the electrolyzer could be used to help clean up the wastewater. So further, further opportunities for McCain's to go even further on their emissions. So just on the, so on the subject of hydrogen, we work with ITM Power out of the UK. They, they manufacture um, PEM, uh, uh, so proton electron membrane uh, exchange um, uh, membra membranes for uh, the production of hydrogen. They've got what they've got their gigafactory in Sheffield, and they've just announced that they're going to double the capacity of that and build a third plant somewhere else in the world. Uh, we've got these units at Toyota, Buller Island. Uh, there's two at Fortescue, and there's more in the pipeline. So the opportunity for hydrogen, uh, and I think the, the the immediate opportunity for hydrogen, while it's using more expensive electrons, I think primarily around heavy vehicle fuels, so trucks, trains and, and buses. Uh, there are obviously hydrogen cars around, but I think the real opportunity is for, is for heavy vehicles. But as that cost of hydrogen does come down, I think more and more we'll see hydrogen being blended into our natural gas networks, and possibly we might even see pure hydrogen gas networks, as has been done in Europe. So the beauty about electrolyzers, and this is if you think about the, in the context of grid stability, with renewables going up and down, a PEM electrolyzer is very rapid responding. So you can actually attach PEM electrolyzers to the grid and you can use them for demand response. And as we've seen in recent times, FCAS and demand response are also mechanisms for connected customers to generate income. Um, the, the, the stacks themselves are, are, are quite simple. Uh, you, used, uh, you used deionized water uh, and you produce ox oxygen uh, at low pressure and hydrogen at between 20 and 30 bar. So that's quite good, that higher pressure hydrogen uh, for downstream uses. 
And the beauty about this technology is it's modular. So the smallest electrolyzers that ITM do at the moment, it's 670 kilowatts. Um, but they're now, and they package that in, in modules of three, if you like, up to uh, two, two megs. And then after that, they've got their 2.5 meg uh, um, module, which can then be packaged up to the much larger 10 megawatt and over systems that are currently going in. And that's the 10 meg one that you can see right there. That's at, uh, at a project in, in Germany. So uh, we're so convinced about the opportunity with renewable gas is that we've actually now formed optimal renewable gas. And I'm pleased to advise that we've recently signed an MOU with a large uh, a partner to produce what we believe will be Australia's biggest um, and first bio LNG project. Um, so, uh, and our aim is to have uh, grid scale biogas projects up the east coast of Australia, both doing LNG and biogas to grid for our existing natural gas connected uh, turbine customers. So, you know, if you look at Australia's natural gas networks, we have a fantastic network of pipelines. So the opportunity to inject natural uh, biomethane into our pipelines is enormous. And what's more is that you can get access to the secondary mains, the lower pressure mains, uh, which are directly connected to customers and you can do this at lower pressure and at a reduced cost. Um, we've also been working on, on other ways to use hydrogen. So we're about to, we've sold our first 100% hydrogen turbines, uh, one to Gemina and another one to the Blue Economy in Tasmania. We've also delivered to, Gen to Gemina a fuel cell, a 30 kilowatt fuel cell, which uses a Ballard fuel cell stack. Um, and, and we believe that these hydrogen, both turbines and electrolyzers, will have a really strong um, of, uh, business case in powering things like data centers, um, in combined heat and power, or cooling applications, because quite often, the, while fuel cells are really good in terms of their efficiency at 55%, the recoverable waste heat is not really very um, high grade. So if you put turbines and, and fuel cells together, then you can get the benefit of the base load high efficiency of the fuel cell. And then from the turbine, you can get electricity and waste heat. So we think there's a really strong case for these technologies to be coupled. Um, we're also doing work with another American company that's working with Capstone. And this is, you know, gas turbines are thermal driven devices. So if you can get any heat in there, then, then you can drive a turbine. So they're 24 seven are developing uh, a solar concentrator to go onto turbines. And we think that's quite interesting. Um, I can give some more information on that. Uh, and all of this stuff obviously feeds, feeds into microgrids and those microgrids can include all of these sorts of technologies that we've just talked about. Um, another way to get heat into uh, turbines is a, a German company called B&K who have done an external combustor on a capstone micro turbine. So here they're combusting renewable wood chips from furniture factories and then turning that waste heat into to drive um, the capstone micro turbine. So lots of different ways that you can generate heat and power from, uh, from waste energy sources or renewable sources. Thank you. Craig, many thanks. And uh, wow, uh, it's optimal not sitting on its hands here. The market's moving quickly and apparently you guys are too. So uh, great, great to see. Thanks for all that uh, coming through there, Craig. Uh, I've only got about 50 questions, but I'll try and narrow it down. I was going to ask about digest state and, and what have you. But great and, and, and a comment that great to see bio LNG. I don't think I've heard of that term before because everyone was just thinking biogas, no worries, just using it in a, in, a, in a network. I don't think anyone had been thinking about the, the bigger potential to, to export that, so great. Um, for everybody out there, um, um, please throw some questions in the Q&A and, and, or the chat and, uh, and uh, Craig will get back to you. But Craig, I just had to, uh, one question there on, on sort of uh, the government support to, that's available for you. We mentioned before this, uh, the new uh, method coming for biomethane, but for a project like you did with McCain, some 14,000 tonnes per annum of CO2 abatement, a really enormous amount. I mean, what was available? Uh, is that uh, McCain's uh, going to be getting a, a VEKs or ACUs or LGCs? What's 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 going to be used down there? Uh, look, they, I mean, they, they did that project on, 
you know, on their own internal returns. So there's no grant money. Uh, there's no, at the moment, uh, other than what they've got with their solar, they certainly haven't got any um, any credits back uh, on the biogas side of it. Um, they will be working on that, but the key the key driver there was that, that they, they needed to go ahead with the project and didn't really want to wait for uh, particular government programs. So it was sort of, um, let's get it done, um, uh, rather than let's wait to see what, what money we can get from government. Yeah, indeed. Um, and and we, we see that um, there's that hesitancy where with some organisations, they're like, well, I'm not really sure what I'm going to get out of these uh, these grants and what have you. So the business case has to stack up on its own. Uh, yeah, and that's, it's, it's, yeah. that's very true. And, you know, the beauty about, you know, if you've got behind the metre energy resources available to you, you know, you, if you compare that to the risk of, you know, grid power, grid gas. I mean, those those costs are only going one way. So I think one of the increasingly attractive things for industry is that if you do this behind the meter uh, or you do some behind the meter as a, as a part of your energy mix, what you're doing is you're locking in those costs and giving yourself uh, um, energy surety where you really don't have any off the grid at the moment. Indeed. Good one. Uh, Craig, there's still a question there in the uh, chat. I'll get you to answer those uh, if you don't mind while, while we move on to our, to our next speaker, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks for that, Craig. Um, our next speaker today is uh, Thomas Strang from Just Send Pacific. Uh, Thomas, I'll get you to uh, share your slide as I give you a quick intro. Uh, Thomas, you're, you're, Thomas is the co-founder and general manager for Just Send Pacific, and, and that's a uh, part of the uh, global Just Send uh, uh, group out of out of Denmark. Uh, Just Send has some 60 years experience and, and over 3,000 biomass boilers in operation uh, all around the world in different uh, different conditions. Um, Just Send has, has done one of those flagship biomass projects there with Arena at MSN Milling. Uh, but today, uh, Thomas, have you got there? I'm not sure if you're going going okay with sharing your screen there. Um, uh, hopefully, you can now launch into your uh, presentation on biomass. That's come through, Thomas. Get you to come off mute, and away we go. Great, thanks. Yes, um, even the Danes find you some kind of tricky to uh, to pronounce. So you're in, you're in good company. Um, so, so basically, um, I am going to run through a presentation quite quite quickly. Um, because what we are finding in Australia is that um, we are increasingly becoming part of the conversation when it comes to companies looking to reduce operating expenses, to decarbonize, to give themselves some option on their, on their thermal energy. Um, and what we have found is that it, it's quite common for the, for the same, uh, com uh, same questions to, to come up. And so what I wanted to do for everyone today is, is basically just run through a, a quick list of, um, of criteria, if you like, or conditions that would make your particular site or, or business um, a good uh, example, a good use case for, for, using, for using biomass. So, um, so the, the first question that, that we come across is, is really the energy cost. And, um, Biomass boilers uh, in Australia certainly compete uh, to displace mostly natural gas systems. Um, we are displacing coal and, and other things, but um, what we base our conversations on all the time is a, is a financial case. And so the first question is, do you basically believe that the cost of natural gas is going to go back to a wholesale cost of $3 an hour? Um, if you do, then that's that's great, and you should you know you should definitely keep sort of wanting for that to happen. If you don't, um, you're probably more in touch with perhaps what's happening with with natural gas prices uh, in Australia and, and and even around the world. Um, there's any amount of data uh, on gas prices in Australia. Um, these are just sort of a few highlights. As you can see, I mean, since basically. 2013, 2014, which is when the export, uh, well, it wasn't even then, it was really 2014, 2015, when the export terminals in, in Gladstone started, started exporting. You can see what's happened to, to the cost of, of wholesale gas uh, in Australia. Um, 
I, I actually remember speaking to companies in, in sort of 2015 and saying to them, you know, we, we anticipate your cost of gas is going to go up by about 20%. And we weren't taken seriously. Um, and of course, it's, it's gone up closer to 200% over that time. Um, so uh, this is basically the, that same graph, um, but the, the red dot that you see on the, on the right-hand side, that's the uh, Asia spot price. For natural gas so it's sitting at about 25 dollars uh, australian a gigajoule at the moment so um certainly if, if i was building a new gas uh plant in in australia that's where you're going to want to target your gas you're going to want to get into the export market and of course that's going to then drag the australian domestic market uh, up up after it um, a, a lot of folks are talking about the, uh, the potential for, for existing uh, gas resources in Australia to alleviate some of the, the um, not only price problems, but, but even supply problems. Um, and that's probably not really going to make much of a difference. Um, what, what this graph here is, is showing uh, in the green columns are uh, gas resources that are already under production. And then the uh, sort of pink ones are the ones that are being developed <clears throat> and uh, the red ones uh, are, the, are the contingent su supplies. Um, you hear a lot about Narrabri uh, being, you know, one of these sort of savior uh, resources, but you can see that, uh, I mean, the, the cost of, of Narrabri at the wellhead is seven or eight dollars a gigajoule. And I mean, that's before everything else that has to happen to it. So the future for Australian gas prices is uh, the risk is definitely on, on the upside. So, uh, so again, if you do feel like uh, this is just a, a passing phase and, uh, and natural gas is, is probably going to go back to what it was uh, seven or eight years ago, then, um, then definitely biomass is not for you. If you do think that perhaps uh, there is price risk around natural gas, then um, let's keep talking. Um, the, the nature of biomass boilers um, is, is really that they're happiest when you start them up and let them run. They're not really that suitable <clears throat> for, for batch processing um, or for, for limited, uh, limited hours a week. So, um, so for example, you know, we're, we're speaking to a company at the moment who, um, who use a huge amount of gas for, for only about three months a year. And so even though they're using a stupendous amount of gas and they're, they're paying a lot for it, it just really isn't um, where, the, where the financial value of a biomass boiler uh, lies. So if you are, for example, only working one shift uh, in, in your manufacturing or your processing, one shift uh, five days a week, um, then it's really not, at the end of the day, going to be worth your while looking into biomass. Um, but if you are running uh, two shifts five days a week, then it starts to become interesting. Um, certainly, by far and away, the most compelling financial cases are, are those uh, those operations that are running, say, 18 plus hours, uh, five or six days a week. That's that's where it starts getting really compelling. And then, of course, what we um, what we find is ideal, what is optimal, are uh, facilities that just have a constant need for thermal energy. Um, so if you are just running those batch processes or if you're sort of reasonably limited in your hours, then as painful as gas prices may be, that's probably go going to be where, where you're going to want to stay. Um, but if you do have those high uptime and those constant energy demand, then um, you're past gate two. Um, the, 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 this presentation is particularly aimed at at what are the slam dunk cases for the biomass. Um, and so I'll give you some context around this slide. Um, if, you're, if your demand for, for energy um, is, uh, is basically less than 180 degrees uh, hot water or you need low pressure steam and you do have those high uptimes and you are paying a lot for your natural gas, then you very much are in that slam dunk uh, case because our boiler systems, the Houston boiler systems are basically divided neatly into sort of low pressure and high pressure. The low pressure systems we, we supply basically off the shelf. So, so they're built in a factory in Denmark and then they're broken down into three or four or five pieces and then they're moved out and they're basically assembled on site. 
Um, if you have high pressure steam, or you need hot water over 180, um, it's it's 100% doable with with biomass. And we're doing three projects uh, which are high pressure steam at the moment. Um, but certainly, if you do need low pressure, for example, if you are in the meat sector, typically um, some parts of the dairy sector, oil seeds processors, um, you know, large facilities like hospitals uh, who need large amounts of, of hot water. Those kinds of uh, low pressure, and for, by low pressure, I mean under 20 bar, that's where you really are in that really compelling case. Um, if you do need high pressure uh, systems, then please talk to us because, you know, as I was saying, we are doing a number of these projects already. We just need to talk through it uh, a little bit with you. Um, are you consuming less than 100,000 gigajoules of gas a year? or equivalent energy. I mean, this really comes back to, um, to the uh, question about runtime. Um, because biomass energy is so much more economical than natural gas, I mean, we can supply energy out of a boiler at, at basically less than $5 a gigajoule almost anywhere in Australia. What you have as your ROI is basically the, the delta, the difference between the cost of biomass and what you're paying for your gas. And then you multiply that by how many thousands of gigajoules you're, you're actually displacing. So what we found is that around this 100,000 gigajoule a year mark, this is where, again, you're really getting into that really strong, really compelling financial case uh, for moving off using natural gas and, and, onto, uh, and onto biomass. Um, basically, it, it's just a function of how much energy we can displace. And as, uh, as you can see on this graph, and this presentation will, will be emailed out to anyone who wants it, the more gas that you're offsetting, really, I mean, the, what you're paying for the gas almost becomes a secondary uh, concern. If we can offset higher levels of, of energy, uh, of higher quantities of energy, the, the business case only improves. Um, and Again, this is a corollary of that, that last um, graph, the payback period uh, falls um, in tandem with it. Uh, so if you are consuming under 100,000 gigajoules a year, it may be worthwhile, and, and I'll, I'll get to these, to these uh, caveats sort of towards the end, but if you are consuming over 100,000 gigajoules, then again, you're very much in that, that range where this is going to be a financially compelling uh, offer for you. Uh, do you have the space and access? Um, gas boilers are great. You know, they're, they're small, um, they're, um, they're well proven. Gas is a great fuel. The only problem is that it's getting extremely expensive. Um, and if I was to diagnose one major difference between gas and biomass, it's that the, just the nature of the biomass boiler is that you're going to need a larger footprint. And the vast majority of that footprint will be in the fuel storage. Um, it's just a, a, a fact of life with biomass that whenever we speak with, uh, you know, start speaking with new clients, we do need to get an idea of, um, of the, the site conditions. So if, for example, you, for some reason, have a manufacturing facility in, you know, the CBD of Sydney, you're probably not going to have the space. Um, typically, we deal with um, companies that are either on the outskirts of metro areas or are regionally based. So as a rule, this isn't normally really an issue for us. And I, I can't really recall a time when we had to stop speaking to a client about, um, about a project because of space. But it's, it's just something that you need to, to bear in mind. Um, just to give you an idea of, uh, of sort of what these, these systems look like, this is a, this is a 15 megawatt um, superheated hot water. This is 174 degree hot water um, that we have running on green sawdust uh, in, uh, in a sawmill in New South Wales. And so this is a, it's a 15 megawatt site. Uh, and these guys also wanted quite a bit of fuel on, on on site uh, in storage, and that's that shed just on the right hand hand side of the picture there. Uh, the the footprint for for this whole system is is around thirty meters by thirty meters, um, and that that's with some room to spare. 
Um, this is a, a significantly smaller system. This is five and a half megawatts, and this is steam. Um, you can see, you know, that there is there is a lot of variation. Uh, the, the footprint for the boiler and uh, and fuel handling on this is is significantly smaller. It's, it's about 15 meters wide. It's about 20 meters 20 meters long or we'll, we'll uh, and it, it's hard to get a good photograph of a biomass boiler because they tend to be quite large and they tend to be indoors. But um, th this is a, a three and a half megawatt system that's running on oat holes uh, in, in Victoria. So, um, so if you are built out to your boundary um, and everything you have on your site is, um, is indispensable, then natural gas is probably where you're going to have to, to end up staying. But if you do have space and we are flexible, with the configuration and with the layout, then that's something that will basically allow you to, to continue to look into this. So basically, to, to summarize, um, your gas price right now is at a new normal and it, it's only going to, to go higher. If you do run more than two shifts five days a week, um, then you're in a really good place to start talking to us about biomass boilers. Um, if your thermal energy requirements are moderate, under 20 bar, for example, um, then it's going to be a very simple install. And uh, if you consume more than 100,000 gigajoules a year of gas and you have the space, then that's something that, that will definitely allow you to, to really look at this and actually have, a, have the promise of this turning out really well for you. So the extenuating circumstances that, that apply to these are, um, are you using LPG? So um, LPG is, just by its nature, you know, going, always going to be an expensive fuel. So if you are using, uh, normally it starts at around 800,000 liters uh, a year of, of LPG, where it starts to get really interesting is at around uh, a million liters a year of LPG. Um, basically, LPG at any price is going to be uh, at, a, at a disadvantage to, to biomass uh, boiler heat. Um, if you are already paying more, than around $14 a gigajoule for your natural gas. Um, and believe me, there are plenty of places in Australia that are, um, then it doesn't, uh, that, then that's definitely a really good place for, for you to start talking to us about. Um, one question that comes up uh, a lot is, do we need to be making our own fuel in order for us to do biomass boilers? Uh, the answer is absolutely not. Um, we only have two clients in Australia who actually make their own fuel and, and use it. Um, most of the time we buy it in. But obviously, if you are actually making your own fuel, for example, I mean, you know, sawmills are, are a classic example. Um, but it, agricultural processes are, are as well. If you are making your own fuel, then that's definitely going to put you already at, at a financial advantage by the living biomass. Um, and are you, are you planning a new build or a greenfield project? Really, what we've been talking about this whole project are, are retrofits where we have to make you or our clients feel good about moving away from a whole bunch of uh, investment you've already made into your natural gas plant. If you're doing a new build, the financial case for a biomass boiler is, is, is really rock solid. And we would encourage you very much to at least uh, consider it and involve biomass boiler in, in your project development conversation. And that's, that's the end. Thomas, many thanks. That was great to uh, run through. And uh, once again, there'll be uh, lots of questions come to mind. I put a comment in there first. You said if, if, if gas is expensive, then, you know, this is, this is great, but uh, this is also about carbon emission reduction as well. Uh, and that's certainly playing a, a big part of the, 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 uh, the puzzle the, and the role for changing here. Absolutely, and and we're we're finding that especially with with multinationals and um, folks who who have you know um, signed themselves up to various protocols and who are under tremendous pressure by their investors to to decarbonize and and you know biomass energy solves that problem definitely. And when it comes to the fuel itself, uh, I've heard it's somewhere between sort of it's viable somewhere between 25 and, and 50 kilometers to, to, to transport the fuel to one to a biomass boiler, uh, you know, depending on the size and things like that. But where do you find the fuel? How, how do you know what's what's available near you? Um, can you give us some insight on that one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's an excellent question. And I would say literally 100% of the time, the first question we get is around fuel. 
It's what can we use, where do we get it from, and how can we rely on it? So we at Yulston Pacific will almost always bring the fuel with us on our, on our projects. We have a network of suppliers literally everywhere that there's in industry in Australia. And these are uh, plantation management companies, these are agricultural processes, they're um, forestry processes. Basically in Australia, it is far more common for us to have biomass fuel without industry than to have industry without biomass fuel uh, within an economical distance. What, what we look at in terms of, uh, of haulage is, is time. Um, basically, we find that it's economical to move biomass around, or certainly our biomass, if the supply is within one to two hours of the site. And um, Australia has huge resources all over the place. And yeah, and we'd encourage you and, and obviously uh, anyone listening to, to come and talk to us about what the options are. Excellent. Thanks for that, Thomas. And uh, so now we'll move on to some other th ways to look at uh, biomass and what you can do with it. And uh, uh, welcome to Dr. Scott Grierson uh, from uh, Pacific Heat and Power. Scott, if you'd like to share your screen, I'll do a, a quick intro for you. Uh, Scott's going to take us through gasification and other, other technologies of what to do with uh, things like biomass. Um, Scott, you're, you're an expert with renewable energy, um, worked across biomass, bioenergy and, and, and different drop-in fuels and what have you. Uh, so it's great to have you joining us today. I know you've done a lot of work with uh, uh, um, different businesses and senior executive roles, so certainly a long history here um, within this space. Uh, Scott, I'll hand over to you to take us through these different thermal processing options. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Jared, and, and appreciate the, the opportunity to speak. Um, am I coming through okay? Yep, screens up and, and sounds good. Excellent. All right, very good. So, um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity and, uh, and great, to, great to sort of be a part and make a contribution here to, to the discussion. Um, what I, uh, when I was first approached by Jared, we were talking about gasification as an opportunity for valorization of, of various different types of uh, residues and, and wastes uh, of different types. And uh, being a, a thermal processing guy myself, I see this as a bit of a spectrum. Um, so, so really, uh, what I wanted to take you through here was, was, was a bit of a broadening of the definition of just, just what I would otherwise describe as gasification and talk about thermal processing as a whole. Um, I suppose the benefit of, of being tech agnostic, Pacific Heat and Power as a developer is, is somewhat tech agnostic. We're a solutions provider, not a, an equipment supplier or an OEM. So, so we think quite broadly about, uh, about the solutions that we bring forward. So being based in Melbourne, it's the Spring Racing Carnival. In fact, I think it's Oaks Day today. So Horses for Courses is a, is a, a throwaway line I heard from Jared earlier. Um, and certainly Alan was alluding to that as well. And I think it's a broad theme that we've heard also from, from, uh, from Craig and also from Thomas that really you've, you've really got to cut your solution and, and your fuel um, and, and your overall design to, to meet the particular duty cycle or opportunity that you're trying to address. So I don't think there's any silver bullets here and I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share another part of that, uh, that equation for you today. So moving right, right ahead, if I can get the technology to work. So as I say, um, really what I'm going to focus on here is in that thermochemical conversion pathway around gasification, pyrolysis and torrefaction as a spectrum of um, thermal decomposition, if you like. So distinct, I guess, from what we heard from Thomas in relation to combustion, and certainly uh, Craig spoke, spoke uh, quite a lot around anaerobic digestion and biochemical conversion. So this is hopefully giving that slightly uh, different perspective. Um, I guess really what, it, before I dive into thermogravimetric analysis, what I really wanted to, to help uh, introduce this, this concept was the idea that really um, this, this thermal processing spectrum is about thermal decomposition of materials. So it's very distinct from combustion, or dare I say it, the dirty word, incineration, where we're actually not burning material, we're not oxidizing it, and there's little or zero oxygen in the environments that are, that are relevant to this. So, um, hang on one second, excuse me. I've got background noise there. <laughs> um, so, so really what we're looking at doing is actually avoiding incineration directly. Um, and, and there's two reasons why you'd want to do this with this kind of process. One is to pre-process and valorize fuel and upgrade it for use potentially in a combustion or, or later in a gasification process. And that will make 
more sense as I talk about it, or potentially for direct use. So converting directly some sort of material into a syngas that you can refine and, and then use directly. Um, but thermogravimetric analysis is really an analytical technique that really describes the behavior and, and the percentage mass loss of a given material as temperature increases. So this generic kind of curve, what it really illustrates um, is, is that there's a couple of different key phases, I suppose, to thermal decomposition. The first phase up to a sort of a moderate temperature range, and this is, don't get too hung up on this specific curve, it's just an illustration, and it varies enormously from different types of materials. But essentially the first stage is really largely around um, dehydration and getting rid of and blowing off the, the moisture content that's inherent in any given material, along with the release of, of some light volatile matter as well. Um, what, what's important to understand is as temperature progresses, what, what occurs is a whole range of these very complex endothermic and exothermic reactions are occurring. So once you sort of move over, it's like the roller coaster and you're coming down that slide, what begins to happen is all of these complex exothermic and endothermic reactions are happening simultaneously. But the net result is that you get to a point largely where that reaction in thermochemistry is driving the further thermal decomposition of the material in a controlled way. So the net result of that is, I suppose it's important to understand that you don't need to put a huge amount of energy in to achieve the thermal composition that you're looking for, because at a certain point, uh, if you like, it runs on its own steam, if you'll, uh, if you'll excuse the pun. So, so that's an important thing to understand. But the second stage devolatilization, which is really that, that sort of, um, that massive drop there is really where the bulk of that mass loss occurs, as you can see in this example. Um, and essentially what's happening is you're devolatilizing that material um, and that's being released as a mixture of syngas, which is a mixture of a whole range of different uh, gas molecules, but also uh, tar fractions, um, which kind of a bio oil fraction um, and some aqueous compounds as well. Uh, and that leaves behind when you get down to the bottom really all you're left over with then is the fixed carbon and the ash in the material and that's what we call um, a biochar or the solid material that's left over at the end of that process of course if you stop that process halfway down that that um, that that curve you'll uh, you'll end up with a proportion of solid material as well um, so it's really just a question of how far you push that based on a range of different operating parameters that include temperature resonance time and also heating rate so why would you want to do this? So let's talk about the thermal conversion spectrum uh, and, and get into the detail of a little bit more. As I mentioned, temperature, residence time and heating rate, it's in a low or zero uh, oxygen environment. Um, really what's important to understand here for all of these three processes in general, you typically require largely pre-dried material that goes into the reactor at the front end. Of course, you can recycle the heat that comes through uh, those volatiles that emanate through that thermal decomposition process and typically they are used to then kind of pre-dry the material at the front end. Uh, this kind, these kinds of processes see a whole range of different solid fuels of various types, uh, agricultural waste, forestry waste, even non-recyclable um, construction and demolition materials and commercial and industrial waste of different types. But really in, in a very generic sense and there will be some exceptions to this, uh, the torrefaction spectrum, spectrum typically kind of functions in that 200 to 350 degrees centigrade uh, sort of range. Uh, and that's useful for valorizing solid fuels into kind of a, a bio coal or variation thereof, a, a homogenized um, bio coal type material. It's really quite standardized in terms of its handling and storage properties. And there can be a syngas that emanates from that that you can even burn it as hot as 650 degrees. Uh, pyrolysis then, or carbonization, particularly in the slow pyrolysis instance, I won't go into too many of the nuances of pyrolysis, but what we call carbonization or slow pyrolysis is, is where you're sort of heating slowly uh, with, with sort of a relatively moderate heating rate within that middle temperature range, 400 to 650 degrees. And that's typically a process that is prioritizing char formation. I did mention before that you get a lot of tar uh, formation and bio oil production quite often, depending on the material again. Um, commercially, what's tended to happen in my observation in the last five to 10 years is that equipment um, vendors and, and others in the space have found the bio oil and tar fractions just incredibly complex and difficult to deal with. So more and more, 
I see that what they tend to do is actually just recrack that, that tar fraction and put it back into the process to use temperature to gasify that and turn that into more syngas essentially. So, so really there is an opportunity for fast pyrolysis, which tends to prioritize oil production, but certainly there's, there's a, lit, a litany of kind of failed large scale plants that have really pursued that technology. I don't want to, I don't want to kind of dish it too much. Maybe they will come forward again, but certainly most of the focus at the moment in my interest at least is on biological carbon capture and storage through that biochar production pathway. And that presents opportunities uh, in agriculture uh, and, and also in metallurgical applications. And we'll talk about that a bit, in, a bit more in a moment. Gasification then is, kicks in at that high temperature range, sort of above roughly 700 degrees. And, and again, what you end up with is, is a mix in gas. Um, and that of course can be reformed uh, and separated into a range of different products. Uh, renewable gases of different types, synthetic natural gas, hydrogen will be, depending on the process, will be a large proportion potentially of that, of that mix in gas. And even industrial CO2, I love the idea of being able to separate, um, as Craig was, was alluding to before, to have a, a biological car uh, carbon dioxide source is kind of a wacky concept, but the idea that you're using a, a biogenic carbon dioxide, dioxide source to actually support industry as well. Um, so there's a whole range of different opportunities there. And of course, the profile of syngases can also be dropped into existing petrochemical or, or, or chemical type uh, industrial processes to produce things like chemical precursors, liquid fuels, and other, other sorts of things. I wanna give you an example of why I think torrefaction is interesting. So this is just an example and a, and a bit of a, a, a mental kind of experiment, if you like, that I did relating to ba bagasse valorization. Bagasse uh, in the sugarcane sector, what's left over after you've crushed the cane, um, you, you would probably be aware, most people would understand that it's, uh, it's a significant volume. Um, some of the players I talked to in Queensland crush or generate in the order of sort of 15 million wet tonnes of bagasse on an annual basis. So these are very, very large volumes of material, um, but it's problematic because it has a very, very low bulk density, like a lot of types of biomass materials and agricultural wastes. Um, and, uh, and it's wet, it comes out wet. So, so really what I wanted to do was illustrate through this table what happens when you torrefy and then and char the material and, and then let's get to the takeaway. The takeaway here is that firstly, as I said before, you're taking the primary volatiles that evolve in that temperature range, in, tor in the torrefaction range, let's say, to then pre-dry at the front end. So if you've got wet material that's coming in at 55%, let's say you're taking 250,000 tonnes of bag acid 55%, and you're drying it down to 9% moisture, right? So immediately you're getting a reduction in the, in the weight of that material down to 136,000 or thereabouts tons. Um, but it's 1.25 million cubic meters. So there's a huge cost. And Jared and I were back and forth on this uh, a couple of days ago. There's a huge cost to the cane guys in actually just shoveling this stuff around and moving it around and handling it. And it creates all sorts of problems. So if you actually sort of seek to torrefy it and standardize it into, let's say, a lightly torrefied bio coal product, what you'll get is somewhere, let's say, in, depending on how far you push it, but let's say 32 to 35% mass loss. So we're going down that curve. But what you've actually done is you've radically enhanced the energy density of that material. So it's up around 22, 23 gigajoules per ton. So the total energy that you've got um, although you've lost some in that devolatilization, it's still pretty similar to what you started with. It's just that it's a much higher energy density than what you, what you began with as a wet material. So at the moment, most of the cogen units, the sugarcane plants, they're all set up to largely get rid of as much of this stuff as possible. They're not designed for efficiency when inherently they're sitting on what I think is, is green gold. Um, but there's lots of opportunities to then leverage carbon abatement credits there. But the key takeaway here is in bulk density, because if you then briquette that material into like a, a small briquetted um, block or, or puck or something along those lines, what you end up with is something around 700 kilos per cube or, or larger. And, and the, the combination of these factors give you an order of magnitude reduction in the volume of that material that you're sitting on. And that's a huge advantage. It's also hydrophobic and has a lot of similar properties to coal, so it doesn't have um, so many problems with long-term storage either. Um, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of value in that. Equally with biochar, there's an example there, if you push the process, you again reduce that bulk density even further. But I'm conscious of time, so I'll keep, I'll keep moving on. 
Many of you will have heard of biochar. I probably don't need to talk about it too much, but it has that opportunity around biological capture and storage, where it's added to soil in particular. It has all sorts of uh, virtuous cycle benefits associated with improving moisture and nutrient retention in soil, turbocharging microbial activity and improving the agricultural production of, of different types of soils. Um, and, and this can lead ultimately to, to significantly increased and well understood and benchmarked uh, agricultural increases in agricultural productivity, sometimes as much as three times uh, what would normally be observed. Uh, and that of course is, is a really, really powerful um, carbon capture um, mechanism ultimately that helps to suck atmospheric CO2 and lock it away in, in, in soil. So uh, I think Jared's going to talk a little bit more about carbon abatement uh, measures further uh, in, in, in this discussion. But what's important to understand is that there are very large and emerging um, biochar related carbon capture and reduction certificates that are coming onto the market around the world at the moment. And they're currently trading as high as sort of in the equivalent in Australian dollar terms, $250 a tonne just in the carbon abatement value alone, let alone the value of the actual material in its application and what you might pay for that as a commodity. Um, finally, gasification, you're moving into that higher, higher spectrum. One of the things that I always think about is, is this a pathway where the so-called non-recyclable materials, the plastics and the ugly stuff that nobody really can do anything with, it just ends up in a hole in the ground, you can technically recycle it or even upcycle it with a gasification process in, in a roundabout kind of a way. So you're using temperature, high temperature to smash the molecules uh, of which that, that polymer might be composed. And that ends up in a mixing gas that can then work through and, and actually ultimately lead to through water gas shift reactions and a whole lot of standard sort of industrial process chemistry to, to a very high proportion of bio volume, for instance, of hydrogen in that instance. So if you're getting paid for that material at the front end, which of course you are, if it's this kind of CMD or CNI waste, then today using known technology, I could deliver hydrogen under $2 a kilogram right now with existing technology. So that's another opportunity and something to think about. So what's in it for me in thinking about thermal processing? Again, it depends on the outcome desired, horses for courses. So what do you need and what do you want to achieve in your business? Um, to also to, to uh, Thomas's point earlier, what kind of material do you already have at your disposal that you can do something with? So is there an opportunity to save on waste management costs by suddenly turning what you would otherwise see as a waste material into something valuable that you can either use yourself or even sell into the market as a valorized fuel? Um, it displaces virgin fossil fuel, of course, by valorizing and using this material or running any number of these processes. Importantly, it improves storage characteristics of these volumes and helps to improve, of course, transport economics and handling characteristics, all of these things, which are important. Um, it enhances the energy density, potentially, depending on which process you go with. And importantly, all of these sorts of processes, including combustion or gasifier, uh, gasification processes, require largely standardized homogenized fuel. So it gives you that standardization, which reduces the likelihood of, of, of plant outages or, or running into problems. Of course, it leverages carbon certificates, uh, and that can even be net negative when you're talking about a biochar product through that pathway, uh, or even through the use of different types of wastes. Um, it's really, really a powerful way to help achieve co car uh, corporate carbon abatement goals, of course. Um, and high temperature gasification in certain instances can even help to denature some of the complex or problematic compounds that do evolve in that moderate temperature range. So using temperature to smash them into relatively benign molecules is, is also one way to deal with those. And it can be applied to a broad range of different waste materials. Just finally, uh, for me, you know, I think I'm particularly passionate about biological carbon capture and storage and biochar. And I think, you know, Elon Musk um, put 100 US million on the table not so long ago to say, Whoever comes up with this great carbon dioxide removal technology, well, I'm going I'm to give you this cash. And I'm like, well, photosynthesis, it was invented a long time ago. Let's just use what we already have and we know it works um, and we can quantify it. And it's a value adding process. It's not a value sucking process. Uh, just finally on Pacific Heat and Power, we're a developer uh, of clean technology assets. So we're a builder and operate. Um, operator. So we're tech agnostic, as I said, so we focus on the best fit for project. And that might mean integrating a whole range of different technologies, not just the ones I've described. It might include AD, it might include combustion, combined heat and power plants. 
um, and or solar or storage. It's really about actually mixing and matching to deliver the outcome for the appropriate context. Um, it's important that we have to, to understand we have the ability to not only design and develop these projects and take them all away from an early stage concept right through to bankable investments. Um, we have the capacity behind us to then 100% equity finance those assets potentially um, based on uh, meeting uh, investment criteria. Um, and, and most importantly, I think for a lot of industrials out there, it's also in a sense, it's a way to outsource the headache. So think of us as an outsource resource that can help to develop assets um, that, that you might uh, want to make use of, or you might just want to buy the outputs of our assets. So the green gas or, or the, the valorized solid fuels. Um, so, you know, a lot of the industrials we talk to, they say, well, this is not core business for us. It's a complex piece of machinery or, or, or plant, process plant. We make milk. That's not what we do. So, so you know, by all means, if, if this is for you, then, then please get in touch with us. Scott, Thank many you. thanks. Uh, a really good summary there of those different options and uh, lots of takeaways there for you. You've condensed a lot into us into a short time. So many thanks for that. And uh, quite a few takeaways there for us. Green gold. Big ass, the big sugar mill sitting on green gold. Love to see them if they were to uh, capture this idea of two hundred dollars per ton of carbon they put away. Uh, absolutely sitting on green gold. Uh, many thanks for that, Scott. And if you've got questions for Scott, Scott, put him in the in the Q and A, and he'll get to type in some answers for you because we're, we're going to keep moving today. Uh, next, we have uh, Kurt Drews to talk about uh, solar solar thermal. Um, Kurt, as you bring up your uh, screen, I'll just give you a quick intro there. So Kurt Drews is the Chief Technology Officer for Vast Solar. He comes to us in Australia with, with a, a fantastic background. Uh, he's a Bachelor of, uh, of uh, Mechanical Engineering and also with the, the, the uh, uh, um, uh, the Bachelor of Administration there as well. Um, Kurt's worked in, in CSP for over 14 years, worked in projects in, in, in Morocco and in Spain, in Germany, so has a fantastic background and experience and skills to, to take us through uh, 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 solar thermal. Kurt, I'll let you come off mute and, and go for it. Right. Can you already see that presentation? Thank you, Terry. That's cut. That's cut. Uh, Go for it. Yeah. All right. So, Vice Solar, just a bit of background. It is a company that develops this vast um, concentrated solar power. But today, I'm not going to present that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about where we see more and more opportunities in the process heat space. Um, all right. So, I'm just going to give you a bit of the market background and then I'm going to propose a few alternative energy pathways and also just touch on some of the dynamics of constraints of renewable energy and what I think would be things to consider in the path forward. So we've seen that slide. Um, it was presented early on today and it's quite a big market of process heat requirements in Australia. And I think the key uh, question and people have alluded to that is that there's several different solutions for different um, um, resources and what's also important is to consider what the process temperatures are that you, you do require and that's where um, solar thermal and the technology that's developed out of the solar thermal industry in terms of thermal, thermal energy storage I think will become a more and more significant player in the space. So we've touched on a few alternatives to, to, to uh, energy sources and um, you know, we've spoken a lot about the biomass pathways. There's obviously a nuclear option, which is not a, the appetite for that is not available in Australia, but there is wind, PV, solar, and we'll touch on electrification of process heat a little bit. And then there's solar thermal, and then what we specialize in is concentrated solar thermal. Um, so just some physics. If you look at um, the energy that comes from the sun, um, at, at the um, distance from the sun, we get an energy intensity of about 1,367 watts per square meter in the upper atmosphere. Those are incredibly high levels of radiation. Um, and effectively what this equates to, uh, before that I should have just um, touched on the fact that we're busy developing a, a, a project up at Mount Isa where we're proposing a baseload um, solution for an industrial mining client where we provide energy 24 by 7 using some natural gas, but not a lot thereof. But what we did for this exercise, we calculated, right, if we use that configuration, 
and we look at the type of radiation levels that we get in a place like Mount Isa, 70% of the surface area of the ACT will cover all the process energy requirements of, sorry, of Australia's industry. So it is a, it's an extremely valuable and also very predictable energy source. And it's becoming interesting how more and more people are realizing the value within that. So this is exactly what um, we've done for the project up at Mount Isa, and I, I think it's a good point. What we're trying to do there is um, develop a base load power application where we provide 50 megawatts to uh, industrial customers. And you can see there that that's your typical uh, solar radiation profile there. And typically on a good day, um, you would have pretty good production, but every once in a while you've got intermittency and you've got things unfortunately called clouds that can impact your quality of supply. But what we have done there is in the day, we generate um, the bulk of our energy through solar PV, which has become an extremely, extremely um, low cost energy source. And it was quite interesting to, to read the 30, 30, 30 target. And I smiled when I saw that because in lots of parts of the world, we've already far below those price levels for, for, for large spray utility PV. And then what we've taken, we've taken that energy and stored it and dispatched all of that energy during the nighttime, okay? So very high quality energy, a relatively economic method to store that energy allows for um, production during your 12 hour night time when there is no sun shining. But what is also important to understand about the constraints of this technology is just the intermittency. And this is one of the fundamental problems in, in my view of renewable energy is both the intermittency of the supply that needs to be matched with the intermittency of demand. And that's a very, very complex engineering problem to solve. And I think people have patted themselves on the back but prematurely and it's been easy to get to, 20, to 10, 20, 30% renewable energy penetration it's going to get a lot harder going forward. But as you can see now, you've got a variation there and those black lines is that we've actually um, compensated with that transit by running off the battery energy system, which stores it in the lithium ion type or equivalent technology. And then on very poor days, we actually have, it's so bad that we need to run um, gas engines to make up for that shortfall. So in effect, to provide you a base load production profile, you need solar PV, you need the CSP, you need the battery and the gas recips. So it's a it's an investment of four four different asset classes to, to give you that firming to achieve a base load um, energy supply. And that's one of the key messages I want to um, pass on today. It is actually very difficult to get to 100% firmed energy uh, scenario, and that's where certain flexibilities are need to be considered in the manufacturing line, and also the, we'll touch on the use of storage. So effectively, in terms of solar, in solar context, we've got a solar resource um, that generally has a low photovoltaic conversion efficiency. That generates electricity that can be turned into heat and that can put in, be put into thermal energy storage. Thermodynamically, this makes no sense, but there are actually projects under investigation and development where excess of electricity is put into thermal energy storage and then that is taken off and converted into mechanical and final electrical um, uh, energy. And if the price mismatch between the lows and the highs is sufficient, that makes absolute sense as an alternative to pumped hydro storage. So there is a real technical solution where we actually take electrical energy, put it to thermal energy storage and pump it out at a later stage. And the reason for that is the economics of the thermal energy storage are becoming more and more competitive. And that's an important message to pass on. What we can also do is take that solar resource, transfer it directly into heat with an extremely high thermal conversion efficiency, put that directly into thermal energy storage and then work on process offtake around that. And that actually becomes a relatively low cost process. And the reason for that is that you've got such a high thermal energy conversion efficiency. Okay. So um, another key point is that through the nature of concentration, 
what we actually end up doing is moving back and closer to the sun and we can get to extremely high concentration factors um, and we're looking at a project for example that we would like to test coming out of the German nuclear industry at Wasara where energy fluxes of four megawatts per square meter are achieved so you can get to very high energy density and the problem from a process perspective is actually how to manage that uh, those energies um, and the transfer nature thereof downstream but that ability also means that ability also means that you get to very high energy storage densities so this is this is a chart where we looked at a project um, where we said what does it mean for csp and how much of their thermal load could we displace and then we realized this is actually not such a good site because of the winter rainfall pattern in the southern parts of Australia and that means that the, the, the rainfall happens in winter and therefore the winter production is significantly reduced compared to summer and then we started looking at how do the investments stack up if we were to add storage and this is the important message once we added investment and assets to storage we actually start making this thing more productive and the energy costs came down significantly and we can get, we just randomly chose there, but we can get to probably around 60% um, LPG gas displacement using solar power um, um, via the CSP process. Um, what I thought I, uh, would be worthwhile sharing, what I did there is I looked at a marginal battery uh, project for a large um, utility project up in Queensland, and then we started looking at solid sensible heat storage options. And then we also looked at it relative to our preferred thermal energy storage, which is high temperature liquid molten salt. And you can see here, compared to batteries, we're looking at energy storage costs that are orders of magnitude lower. And I think that is one of the real opportunities that exist out there. So hopefully I've touched on some of the dynamics here. I've kept it quite short, but I think what's important is what will change, okay? Um, we need to think about flexible manufacturing system. As I said in the past, um, as I said previously, it becomes harder and harder to get to a 24 by 7 energy supply. And the same applies to processing. So any types of processes that are planned around being more flexible around this variable primary energy um, resource is going to be more and more part of the discussion. Okay, and we've seen that with the mining climate. If the sun doesn't shine, does it make sense to turn off a mill? Okay, sometimes it does because you've got a daily production cycle that's got ebbs and flows in any case. Another key point is electrification will become a key enabler of renewable process heat. All right, whether it's through heat pumps or direct um, at low cost putting heat into storage at very high temperature, that's really easy done. Um, that's going to become part of the mix. Uh, we've also got to look at the varying sources of energy demand and the supply of energy and how that dependent as a function of location. How does it affect time of day of use? Is there a way to put in a daily uh, production window? Sometimes it's very difficult for continuous processes. But these are the type of questions that planners should put into 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 the the, the um, into the decisions about where new new future factories are placed. Another key factor here is that this requires significant capital investment. All right, this is not a cheap business, the long-term costs are becoming more and more competitive. There's a clear cost reduction pathway, which I think is just a matter of time till the consumers um, see the benefit thereof. But what's also important is the financial services need to be developed around this. And we've seen that with kind of utility scale PVs, it's pretty easy and the interest rates have been uh, declining steadily. And that's been one of the major contributors to the decline in renewable energy costs because investors have become more and more confident in these type of configurations. There's also a question about transmission costs. That's a major problem. If you look at the cost of production and the transmission costs that are um, affect um, energy, I think the, the policy around those need to be challenged. There could be a potential energy increase in energy transmission and also the time of day when these type of um, almost excess electrical energy um, supplies are put on the market that you know, how do we transmit this and make use of those low costs for process heat is a key question we need to ask ourselves. Um, 
What's key here is that the solar resource in Australia is world class, and I think that's a very important thing to take home. But it does also have an impact on where the plant is located. As fur the further that you go inland, the higher the, the use of solar, concentrated solar energy could become. And the whole energy resource and land becomes a key factor when you start looking at new capacities and new factories. And I think that's, that's a message we're trying to drive very hard um, you know, for decision makers in terms of planning where these type of energy production, production facilities would be situated. They should be situated in places where you get the highest sunshine. But the same is true for um, considering decisions around process heat applications. Okay. Um, Kurt, many thanks for that and uh, points well made. And uh, you're right, we, we, with these renewable energy zones that we see happening within New South Wales and Victoria, that's only going to encourage that more regional production. Uh, so absolutely. And uh, we'll be following the, the Mount Isa project with interest. That uh, seems like a great project that you guys are working on. We'll, we'll be keen to see how that uh, that one progresses. So, uh, but uh, many thanks for that uh, presentation. Um, we, we are running short of time, but we're going to try and uh, do a little quick wrap up here with, uh, with Alan uh, joining me now um, and to talk about uh, end user energy services. It wouldn't be A2EP if we were just talking about supply of energy and didn't talk about demand and the use usage of that. Um, Alan, could you run us through quickly on, on, on um, uh, the idea of, of, of looking at your uh, energy demands first before deciding, okay, how much, what, what, what sort of technology should I use and, 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 and what, I, what I should be investing in? Yep. Thanks, Jared. Jared, I, I, I will be quick. Um, this first slide is really just an example of the textile industries and uh, the left hand side I've really covered all those options earlier so the main focus of this is really that table on the right hand side where you see that these people are getting pretty smart they're analyzing all of the different processes they've got and the temperature requirements that they've got so that they can use a mix of point of use technologies heat recovery a whole range of things like that to optimize their their options and also when they understand this much, they can be very flexible, which is something that I think Kurt's emphasized that we're gonna do. The next slide is really another example. Uh, one of the things about heat pumps is that they are very sensitive to the inlet temperature and the temperature rise. And this is just one example from an aquatic center where we're using the enormous amounts of latent heat and warm air uh, as, as an inlet to the heat pump dramatically improving the coefficient of performance in this case from 2.7 to 4.1 but also importantly in places like Melbourne raising the condenser temperature so that it's never below freezing point and so you avoid the problems of icing up and and loss of output under those kinds of conditions if you go next thing thanks Jared the other thing interesting about this is that the big savings that come here are in winter and as Kurt's been talking about. We, we've got issues. We've got lots of solar energy in summer, but not so much in winter. So if you've got a rooftop solar system, um, these kinds of energy recovery systems for low temperature systems like this can be uh, very attractive. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Alan. And, and as you, you mentioned before, there, there's so much, uh, so many cases of, of, of processes where uh, heat's just going up the stack in, in uh, as humid air from dryers and things like that. So much potential for heat recovery there. Um, so thank you. A point well made. Um, so before I, I give a wrap up and, and what we're what coming up next, just a, a very big thank you to our speakers today, uh, Craig Dugan from Optimal, Thomas Strang from Just San Pacific, uh, Scott Grierson from uh, Pacific Heat and Power, and then Kurt Drews from Bar Solar. Many thanks to our speakers today. Uh, moving on with A2EP, uh, we've got plenty of uh, great webinars and events coming up this month. Uh, next week, we're looking at high temperature heat pump uh, solutions, and that's looking at those heat pumps uh, operating between sort of 100 and 160 degrees, uh, where, where demonstration uh, plants 
experiments have been done in Europe and, and things are being done in the lab over there. Uh, we've got Dr. Corden Arpagus uh, joining us. He did a presentation for us last year and really blew us away and created almost a, a Bible of, of high temperature heat pumps. He's coming to join us again to, to update the Bible. And, uh, and uh, after a quick chat with him, I'm quite amazed at how much things have moved in the last 12 months. So, so look out for that one. That one's coming up next Wednesday. Uh, we've also got two other uh, webinars. Uh, uh, very much industry focused. One is for heat recovery and heat pumps in meat processing, and one is looking at decarbonisation within the beverage industry. Uh, those uh, webinars are uh, a bit closed off for, for industry professionals uh, working directly with those and for A2EP members. Uh, but if you did have a special case for joining that one, please do let us know. Um, so yeah, plenty of good things happening this month. If you want more of A2EP, I suggest you, you follow us on uh, LinkedIn, plenty of posts and things and, and all the new publications that we're doing all coming up there. Um, so yeah, with just a, a minute over time, I hope that's okay by everybody. Uh, many thanks for joining us today. We'll get the slides and the recording out to you next week. And uh, we look forward to you joining us for our very next webinar next Wednesday. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.